Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Political power in Israel has passed from Shimon Peres and the Labor Party to Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud Party. Some observers say Likud places peace in peril, but supporters of Likud say hardliners can be the best peacemakers. Nixon to China, Begin to Egypt. To better understand how Likud and its new leader might act, we examine the roots of the party and the mythic founder of Zionist revisionism, the highly controversial Vladimir Jabotinsky. Joining us to sort through the conflict and consensus are Ruth Weiss, professor of Yiddish and comparative literature at Harvard University and the author of If I Am Not For Myself, The Liberal Betrayal of the Jews. Yehuda Reinhardt, president of Brandeis University and author of Chaim Weizmann, The Making of a Statesman. Judith Miller, correspondent with the New York Times and author of God Has 99 Names, reporting from a militant Middle East. And Samuel Heilman, professor of sociology and Jewish studies at City University of New York and the author of Defenders of the Faith, Inside Ultra-Orthodox Jewry. Also on this program, an interview in Israel with Shmuel Katz, author of Lone Wolf, a new two-volume biography of Vladimir Jabotinsky. The topic before this house, Revisionism Revisited, this week on Think Tank. Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi, and his Likud party beat Shimon Peres and the Labor Party in Israel's first direct election of its prime minister. It was close, 50.4% for Netanyahu, 49.5% for Peres. On its face, the election appeared to break along right-left conservative liberal lines. But beneath the surface of the Labor-Likud split are deep and complex intellectual roots that long precede the founding of the State of Israel. Shmuel Katz uh, in Tel Aviv, welcome. You, you joined with and for Jabotinsky and were a great admirer of his. When you see and hear Bibi Netanyahu today in the Likud party, do you hear uh, echoes of Jabotinsky? I would say yes. The battlefield was a different battlefield, Ben, but the, the spirit, I think, is there. My impression is, by the way, that uh, the, the basic principle of Jabotinsky's activities, and that is to face up to facts, I think that this has been inherited by, by Bibi. Could you give us a, uh, a brief history of Jabotinsky's life? He was born in, in, uh, in Odessa uh, in 1880, and he became famous as a young man, as a Russian writer. Uh, but uh, after, the, uh, after he had some experience of uh, Russian uh, anti-Semitic pogroms, he became one of the greatest agitators, or shall we call it propagandists, of the Zionist movement in Russia. Subsequently, he became a foreign correspondent of a Russian newspaper uh, just before World War I, and as soon as Turkey entered the war, he decided that the Jews must form a a, a, an army in order to help drive the Turks out of Palestine and thereby establish a stake for the Jewish people uh, in that country. He subsequently became a, a, a leader, a formal leader in the Zionist organization, but he broke with uh, Weizmann uh, and uh, their differences were uh, constituted the, the main element in Zionist history between the early 20s and the late 30s. How did uh, Jabotinsky's opponents characterize him at that time? They characterized him as a fascist, as a militarist, and uh, uh, as uh, consequently a, an enemy of the workers. Now. None of this was true, of course. What was uh, Jabotinsky's influence in the Palestine of that day? You know as well as I do how many people used to regard Jews as cowards and they wouldn't fight and so on. And um, uh, Jabotinsky proved to the world that, that, this was, that this was an archaic idea, that it wasn't true, that Jews fought as well and perhaps sometimes better even than many of the, of the non-Jewish people among whom they fought. He, when he started 
his career as a young man, one of the first uh, one of the first phenomena that he encountered was in the Kishinev pogrom, where uh, Jews, young and old, allowed the the pogromists to murder and rape without lifting a finger to to resist them. Jabotinsky at that time uh, started the first self-defense movement in Russia, and uh, he the the idea of defending yourself, of standing up straight and not and not uh, bowing the knee to 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 um, to uh, to uh, to um, attacks on you and to fight for your to fight for your rights and to fight for your to fight for yourself and your family, that was something that was foreign to the to the whole ghetto spirit. Now Jabotinsky made it one of his one of his life's works to change that. He had a tremendous, I think, a unique uh, 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 um, influence on the youth of perhaps two generations. Uh, thank you, Shmuel Katz uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, here. Let's go around the room uh, quickly, starting with you, uh, Ruth Weiss. Uh, do you hear uh, echoes of the old uh, revisionist Zionists, Jabotinsky, in, uh, in today's Israel led by uh, Bibi Netanyahu? I think that in the um, inclusiveness of his idea of uh, Zionism, he is very much in the Jabotinsky tradition. That is to say that for him, uh, Zionism is not subordinate to any other consideration. It's not subordinate to socialism, and it is not subordinate to uh, Jewish religious fulfillment. And I think that that, too, is very squarely in the Jabotinsky tradition. Uh, Sam Heilman, is this uh, sort of um, uh, Jabotinsky revisited, or is there no connection? I'm not sure if it's Jabotinsky revisited, but clearly there is a division that has existed for a long time between socialist Zionism and that revisionist Jabotinsky version. And that is that it seems to me that the revisionist Zionist point of view was that the people exist for the sake for the sake of the state, for the land. Uh, whereas the socialist Zionist point of view was that the state is a medium, a mechanism for creating a particular kind of society. And in that kind of division, uh, one sees, I think, echoes uh, in today's politics. That is, does the state come before everything else and that without a sovereign state and a powerful state you can't have a powerful nation? Or does the society come first and the state becomes a mechanism, a place, a locus for that society? Right, we will return to that. Judy Miller. Well, I hear faint echoes of Jabotinsky in the words of Bibi Netanyahu. I hear much more direct echoes, immediate, in the words of a profound influence on Bibi's life, and that is of his father, a great scholar, a man who was very close to Jabotinsky. I think to understand Bibi, you've got to understand the father and uh, his interpretation of what Jabotinsky meant. But really, when I listen to Bibi Netanyahu, I kind of see Bill Clinton. I <laughs> listen to a man who uh, will do whatever it takes to get elected, and I hope to be successful, or otherwise we're in for a very rough time. OK, uh, Yehuda Reinhardt. Well, uh, Jabotinsky, first of all, was very often at odds with the party he led. And so many people have their own Jabotinskys. Uh, he used to have a favorite expression that Zionism is 90% settlement and 10% politics, but that politics is a sine qua non for everything else. I think in that sense, perhaps, uh, Netanyahu reflects some of the ideas of uh, Jabotinsky. But let me say right uh, off the bat that I don't believe that any of us uh, know enough about uh, Bibi Netanyahu at, at, this, at this point. Um, what were the revisionists revising? What, what, what are, where does the term revisionism come from? I think that uh, what he was revising, what the Zionist revisionists were revising, uh, beginning in 1922, more uh, aptly 1923, was Zionist policy to, as they said, reflect Herzl's original purpose in creating the Zionist organization. And here's the irony. The Theodore Herzl, the really the founder Theodore of modern Herzl Zionism. Theodore Herzl is the founder of political Zionism. Yeah. We're now celebrating 100 years of political Zionism uh, right as we speak. Um, Theodore Herzl, of course, called for a, a home for the Jews, a Heimstätte, to, to uh, use the German expression which he used. 
Um, and uh, of course, what Jabotinsky wanted was a political state, that is, a Jewish state. Uh, and I think that one of, his, one of his contributions, of course, is to articulate exactly that, <laughs> that what the Zionists wanted is a Jewish state to hark back to Herzl what, what, is not quite correct. Right. What, what was the, the bitterness about? What was the, the, the fight? I mean, I, as I understand it, the, the, it turned violent at times. It was a uh, well, very difficult... I, I think the bitterness was there not just between Jabotinsky and others. The bitterness was there because there has been infighting uh, in Jewish life. It always seems to me like a principle of physics that as the external pressure on the Jews increases, the internal fighting among the Jews also increases, like the particles, like atoms, you know, getting at one another. But um, I think uh, following up from what you would have said, that uh, I, I think it is the question of his putting the emphasis on uh, the politics. In other words, I think that uh, what he saw was that the transformation of the Jewish people politically was at the heart of the Zionist problem that Jews had been a politically dependent people for uh, the better part of their history and for all but about 120 of the last 2,000 years. And that the transformation of a people from a politically dependent people, it's not that they didn't have politics, but they were politically dependent. And everything in Jewish psychology and everything in Jewish political organization had to do with accommodation, uh, with working things out, with playing things uh, around. Now you had to transform the people, and that meant doing what it took. I think so. to answer your question of what the, the bitterness was about is that really what we're dealing with here is an effort to define what will be the nature of the national liberation movement of the Jews, which is called Zionism who will determine what its character will be and through that what the character will be of the new Jewish people who will no longer live a, an existence in exile as a minority uh, dependent upon someone else's good graces, subordinate. What will that require? And I think that uh, what the, the socialist Zionists said was that the only way that we can liberate Jews is to create a society in which they are sovereign and in which uh, in effect all the principles of socialism can include Jews as well. And what the revisionist Zionists said is that, that that is all true but the first and most important element of that is to have sovereignty over a particular piece of territory, only one piece of territory, not one that would be in Africa or that would be in Grand Island in the, in the river, in the Niagara River, but in uh, what was then called Palestine and that it should be totally defendable, it should be as large as the biblical the, the, land the, the, of Israel. The Zionists at that time were offered Uganda by the British. Well, what is actually in Kenya. Yeah, Kenya. In 1903. Yeah. And, and, and some of them were willing to take it because the argument was we're interested in changing the nature of a Jewish society and if we have to do it in, in Kenya or Uganda will do it there. In fact, that never worked because the recognition was that there's some historical elements here that you can't just do it anywhere. What I'm struck by in Jabotinsky is this incredible uh, ability and determination to face facts. And it's that that I think you really hear the most echoes of in the current debate in Israel today. I mean, Jabotinsky knew and said what few people wanted to acknowledge then, few Zionists really wanted to face, which was they were on, quote, other people's land, people who would not be moved, people who would not welcome them, no matter how prosperous their presence made that society, that they would have to fight for the land, that there would have to be an iron wall between the local population who were there and the new immigrants, and that ability, that, that, that determination. That was the title of uh, Jabotinsky's famous book, Absolutely. The Iron, Iron Wall. Absolutely. Right? You hear this now in the uh, Likud calls for separation, for uh, we must face facts. They will never love us. The Palestinians will never really accept us. It's this unwillingness to see the world as we would like it to be, and a determination to see it as it is and to draw the proper policy conclusions from facts on the ground. And it also says yeah, that, that under those conditions, democracy is not necessarily the highest ideal. That the highest ideal is maintaining the integrity of the Jewish people and their continuity. Well, he, he was always a Democrat, small Absolutely. d, wasn't he? Absolutely. Uh, Jabotinsky he, really... He never wavered from that, as I understand not it. At all. I mean, Judy mentioned the, the two magic words, I think, which were face facts. I mean, that was sort of uh, Jabotinsky's uh, marching song. Wasn't it? 
is, is this argument between the people who are saying face real tough facts and, uh, and between those who say, well, this is what we would prefer the world to be like and we think it can be like. I mean, I, when I hear this argument, uh, it, it just says to me, growing up in America, Cold War. I mean, this is exactly the rhetoric that we heard in the United States for 30 years between the hawks and the doves. I think that a healthy society, in fact, probably splits down the middle mm -hmm. between uh, hard and soft, because each person uh, who is healthy uh, splits right. between a hard part of himself and a soft part of himself. But I think that the question here is really much compounded. It, it, it's not the comparison with the Cold War, because uh, unfortunately, anti-Semitism happens to be a reality not only a reality, but it's one of the most powerful political forces in the modern world. Uh, this is not an invention of Jewish militarists. Uh, it, it is just simply a fact. And uh, facing that fact uh, puts an intolerable pressure on the Jews. I mean, there are these people who organize their political idea of who they are in contradistinction to the presence of the Jews in their midst. Uh, blaming the Jews for everything that's wrong in their society. And I think that that's one of the reasons that Jews are so tempted to look away, to try to strategize so that they can remain neutral. I think, I think that uh, in a way uh, what Ruth is saying is that the face facts side of things is that the world is against us and that the opposing point of view is a more humanist uh, uh, attitude that says that it is possible for a coexistence to to occur across religious and ethnic lines. I think that one of the, the divisions that one gets here is that uh, the idea that uh, the Arabs will never be able to live with us, will never be able to accept us, and the other that says that we can create a kind of egalitarian society, a socialist society in which the welfare of all people, regardless of who they are, can somehow be maintained. And that has been in some ways really at the heart of the Zionist argument. Ju Judy, is, is that face facts thing, is, is that what drove this last election? In part, I, I think uh, there were so many factors involved in this, it's going to take a long time for us, us to sort mm. it out. But there were two visions of Israel offered in this campaign. One was Shimon Peres's New Middle East, what Sam has just described, this, uh, this world in which Israel would be a normal country of normal people, citizens, surrounded by normal people who also want the Arabs the same thing. That they would seek common interest and mutual prosperity. That in other words, there would be a world in which economic factors was more important than the traditional tribal religious rivalries that have so plagued this region now. That's one vision. The opposite, of course was the, uh, to be pejorative, you could call it almost a ghetto mentality, the notion that Israel is a peculiar place filled with people who will never be accepted ever by their neighbors, uh, that it can depend on no one despite its alliance with the United States or de facto alliance. I see this really more as a continuum. I don't see this as a division between one mm -hmm. side and the other. I think that both elements really are reflected in both camps and have been since the inception of Zionism. If we can go back to the comparison of Jabotinsky yeah. and Netanyahu for a second. Uh, Jabotinsky was, uh, I think, one thing that characterized him uh, as probably, I would argue, despite my fondness for Weizmann, as one of the uh, probably most interesting of the Zionist leaders. But there was also a very strong pragmatism to what he did. I think I see the same thing in, uh, in Bibi. Pragmatism uh, I or opportunism? I, I, would say, I would say that we have to differentiate between between uh, election rhetoric mm -hmm. and actually what's happening. And if, if we just look at the cold facts, and, I, and I've said before that we know very little about Bibi at this point. I know very little about Bibi at this point, uh, despite the fact that I've read his books. Uh, I would say that um, if you look at what the, the campaign rhetoric was and what the statements have been since then, I see a very pragmatic politician. I see somebody who I would say is a combination of an American Republican in terms of his economic philosophy uh, and a, pragmat a, a pragmatic uh, Israeli politician, perhaps with a tinge of revisionism there, if one could say that. We have to look at all of these arguments and divisions and ideological distinctions in context. And the context has changed. We're no longer talking about a nascent 
country. Uh, we're talking about a nation that is accepted even by its enemies as a reality in the world of, uh, in the community of nations. And I think uh, for that reason, uh, exactly as Yehuda has pointed out, that uh, we have to look at uh, Netanyahu in the context of the real politic of today. The train has left the station. What he can do is he can push on the throttle or he can pull back on the throttle, but he's not going to make that train go a different direction. Judy, you, you've covered the, uh, the Arab world for several, <laughs> several years. Uh, <laughs> does that sound uh, a, a Well, little, I think uh, it would sound plausible if Bibi Netanyahu were able to set the agenda. Exactly. The problem is there are other players out there on that uh, playing field. And the interests of Hezbollah and Hamas and Islamic Jihad are very different from that of Bibi Netanyahu's. He cannot control how they will react, no matter what the Arab states do, to make his life easier or complicate it. There are facts to be faced on the Arab side as well, and one of them is that if they choose to provoke Bibi Netanyahu and the State of Israel, and I think that will be their strategy, uh, he's go his options will be limited. He's not alone. I think that that's why it's important to uh, perhaps uh, uh, change uh, the rhetoric that you introduced and this concept of the ghetto mentality, which I think is really not, uh, not only not fair, but I don't think it's accurate, and go back to what uh, Yehuda was saying before uh, that is so characteristic of Jabotinsky. It's hardly a question of seeing the world as us and them, and certainly not that the whole world is against us. That was not at all uh, what uh, I intended to uh, imply in pointing out the reality of anti-Semitism where it exists as the organizing principle of politics. It doesn't exist in all the world. Therefore, it's possible to make alliances, it's possible to look reality square in the face, and to be an optimist doing so to say we do have certain options. It's really not the issue of anti-Jewishness. That's not what's going on in the Middle East. You have a struggle over territory. That's what's happening well, in the I'm Middle East. Well, I'm not sure. I know that, I, I mm -hmm. mean, you're, you're, you've written more about this from the inside mm -hmm. than I have. But I do know that the, the, the kind of rhetoric that one hears, even in the United States and Middle East programs. No, especially uh, in the United right, States and Middle East United programs, States, and what but one not finds, in the Arab world. Well, uh, I, 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 that, that may indeed be. But I do think that the presence of Israel is used politically in, the, in very similar ways, not identical ways, but very similar ways to the presence of the Jews was used in European politics. I, I think it's world. not just territory. I think that it is the question of will the world accept us as a people and as a people with a right to exist and obviously here is where we exist. In Israel, as indeed for the entire Jewish community throughout the world, the antenna is always out there to look for, this, for the first sign that the world wants us gone in one way or another. I think that is part of the equation. I think that's part of the struggle over the land. I mm -hmm. think one dimension that we have not uh, spoken about uh, concerning this new government is clearly some of the issues are land. I mean, mm -hmm. It's incontrovertible. What is the peace process about? It's about land. It's about land. Uh, of course, there are larger issues around it, but land is obviously at the core. Uh, is it going to be the Golan? Is it going to be the territories? Is it going to be et cetera? Uh, that clearly is there. I'm just as interested to know, mm -hmm. and I don't know, what is Netanyahu's vision of the Jewish people, mm -hmm. of the people in Israel, of the relations between Israel and the diaspora. Uh, my sense is that uh, he is going to uh, fight for a very strong uh, nation. I think that he has, just much as he has constraints that are political from the outside, he has clearly constraints mm -hmm. from the inside. And I think there is going to be the art of the politician. And Yehuda, you talked about uh, the Jabotinsky emphasis on a Jewish state. I mean, that's a very open question. What does it mean to have a Jewish state? How do you define it? What is temporal versus uh, spiritual well, authority? Right. What, is what is a Jew? Well, <laughs> what is a Jew? Who is a Jew? Well, that's another program. Thank you, Ruth Weiss, Yehuda Reinhardt, Samuel Heilman, and Judith Miller. And thank you. We enjoy hearing from you. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036, 
or we can be reached by email at thinktv at aol.com or on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com for Think Tank. I'm Ben Watney. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.